Thank you. All right. Okay, thank so you. On, uh, on June 6th, 2016, about two years ago, I started at a company then known as Hyperloop One. The goal of the company is to create super fast transportation systems where you're firing, essentially levitating buses through vacuum tubes between cities faster than airplanes. I was uh, hired after we had raised 115 million. I was employee number 142. And uh, I was hired as assistant general counsel in charge of regulatory and government affairs in a company where, where government uh, was really important to our business. A week later, the following Tuesday, on June 15th, 2016, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, the second highest court in the land, issued a decision upholding uh, a net neutrality rule that the FCC had, had, had uh, come down with. Now, this was a net neutrality order that I had spent over a decade working on every piece of it, and it was just this huge, exciting moment and accomplishment, and, and just great for the, for the country, in my view. And even though net neutrality is going through a rough patch at the moment, this victory was, was essential. The very next day, after my greatest triumph, uh, on that Wednesday, June 16th, um, there was a founder dispute at Hyperloop One that nearly tore it apart. Right? So there are founder disputes at lots of companies, but there was a little bad blood. So by the end of that Wednesday, here are the, here are the lists of executives that were gone for the, from the company. The co-founding CTO, co-founding number two engineer, the, who came back eventually, the head of finance in a finance-intensive company, the head of business development as we're trying to develop business, the general counsel, my boss at the time, and the other assistant general counsel. So if you're doing the math, there's exactly one executive left, the CEO. Uh, his name is Rob Lloyd. He'd been the president of Cisco, seasoned CEO. He takes me for a little walk at 11 a.m., and he says, Marvin, this might be a case of last man standing. How good a lawyer are you? I said, I'm, I'm really good, actually. And uh, he said, OK, thought so. Uh, you're now the general counsel, and I'll, I'll need you by my side as we save this company. And so the general counsel role is actually very much a business role. It's not like an outside lawyer role. You're, you're on the senior leadership team. You kind of see every part of the company, the engineering from the patents to the contracts. The, uh, you manage usually the board of directors, which is a whole bunch of influential you know, billionaire investors. You're, you're part of almost every decision and strategy. And so if you're doing the math at this moment, there are now two executives running this 150-person company, the CEO, a seasoned veteran, and me, the new guy. Now, not only was I in my second week at Hyperloop One, but this was my second week at any company. I had never worked in a company before. I was looking for company experience. I, I was known uh, as a good lawyer who had done a lot of internet freedom work, a lot of big cases in internet freedom. And I was also a you know, free speech scholar when it came to writing a lot in that space. Uh, I was an English major, never took a business class. Uh, but uh, but you know, he, he, here I was uh, helping to run the, run the company. And I remember uh, years earlier, a venture capitalist had given me some advice. She said, Marvin, never take a job you're qualified for, because then you'll never learn. And, and here I was, totally taking her advice. And I know you're thinking, God, this sounds like an episode of Silicon Valley. It's just, it sounds like it can't be real life, like it was totally insane. Well, there was a lawsuit that came out of this, and according to Wired Magazine, it was a little insane, right? but that was, Two years ago, the company has, uh, has moved forward quite a bit. And in the last 20 months, we rebuilt the leadership team. Uh, and it turned out I was actually really good at being a business executive. I helped you know, raise $185 more million for the company, helped hire a stellar legal team, helped hire the other executives. And, uh, and I ended up learning a lot in this experience. And my path 
And I ended up being one of pretty much the four people running this company that's now 250 people. It's now raised $295 million. And it rebranded to Virgin Hyperloop One with Richard Branson as our chairman. And you know, he, he comes with experience from Virgin Trains, Virgin America, Virgin, Virgin Airlines. Uh, and the company is moving in the right direction. Um, now, now, don't tweet this part. I guess this, this will be public. But I actually I left Hyperloop One a few weeks ago. And I'm joining uh, a well-known cryptocurrency company as part of a sort of long-time passion of mine in cryptocurrency. Um, but the, um, the, uh, the thing that I, that I get asked all the time about Hyperloop One from friends of mine who, who, who know me is, Marvin, why weren't you scared away? Why did you, why did you stay <laughs> in the middle of all of that? And my answer usually is that I thought it would be fun, uh, that I thought I'd learn a lot. And the longer answer is, uh, essentially, we're all going to die. We are like microorganisms on a s small blue rock that circles around an insignificant star in the corner of a mediocre galaxy. Uh, that's one of 100 billion galaxies. And so we might as well try to have fun. You spend a lot of time at work. And my entire career has just been doing what I thought was fun until it wasn't fun anymore, and then doing something else. There might be better ways to build a career, but that's, that's the thread you'll, you'll see throughout. So uh, today, I'm going to sort of just, there's going to be three parts to the talk, really. I'm going to talk about my education and growing up. And that's a picture of me reading a book. Uh, then I'm going <laughs> to talk about my time as an activism, uh, working on internet freedom. That's me at the, you know, the dockyards being an activist. And then I'm going to talk uh, about my time spending uh, a few years as a you know, business executive leading a, a well-known, you know, helping to lead a well-known startup. And that's a computer-generated image of what I will look like in a few years as a business leader. Um, so, uh, early years. Uh, I was born in Southfield, Michigan. Uh, my parents, who are here, uh, are Chaldean. So they're uh, Iraqi immigrants from a small village called Tulkif. Uh, and they are farmers. I think my dad went to sixth grade, maybe eighth, sixth, ninth, ninth grade. And my mom graduated from high school. Uh, and so none of them went to college, um, but they were really uh, interested in education for their children. I ended up going to Brother Rice High School. Uh, my father, like most of the Chaldeans at the time, owned a convenience store. And like most of the kids at the time, I worked in this convenience store uh, during the summers. Uh, and I knew that if I didn't do well in school, I'd be ringing up Doritos and Budweiser the rest of my life. And so I studied really hard. Uh, and luckily for me, I uh, liked books. I liked video games. I liked sports. But I really liked books, and I spent a lot of time reading. And when I was in high school, I was trying to think about what would I do with my life, what my identity was, what my purpose was. It was sort of the big questions you wrestle with as you're you know, you know, facing the rest of your life. And I read a lot of books, um, as I said. And one of them that I remembered that I you know, bought in a used bookstore on Remainder, this is you know, before Amazon kind of, was, was this book. Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre is a, is a French intellectual, the father of existentialism. And most of his books are super dense, impossible to read. But the first essay was a speech that he gave. And I mean, to this day, if I want to learn something complicated, I turn to speeches and interviews and podcasts where people have to simplify their, their ideas. And I actually understood this essay. And what he said was essentially, you're not born with a purpose to your life. You're just kind of born and thrown into the world. And then someday you make your own purpose when you're old enough through your decisions, your mentality, and through the actions that you take. Right? You create your own purpose. And a corollary of this is that you're not the actions you didn't take. And so, you know, I'm sure all of us in this room remember some kid in grade school who said to you, yeah, you get good grades, but if, but if I studied hard, I'd get straight A's too. And the point is, you didn't study hard, and we did, right? You don't get credit for not doing the things that you wish you did. Like people who say, 
I could have been a golfer if I just stuck with it. Like, you didn't, I'm not gonna, you, you didn't become a golfer. No one's gonna judge you based on what you thought you could have done if you'd gotten off the couch and did it. And so this, you know, always made me feel like I needed to take risks, I needed to be willing to put myself out there and to do things, because I didn't want to be someone who said, you know, gee, had I just left my law firm, I could have gone on and had an interesting legal career, but I stuck with it. I wanted to actually go out and live my life uh, based on, and be judged by my actions. So, armed with that, I ended up going to the University of Michigan. Uh, all five of my parents' children ended up going to the University of Michigan. And when I showed up to Ann Arbor, to me this was the greatest place in the world. Right? There were all these smart, interesting people, all these great professors. Uh, it was like the, the scene in The Wizard of Oz where her life was in black and white and then it all became in color. Uh, and I didn't know what I wanted to do yet, but I, got, I learned a lot of really interesting skills. So I was a, a literature major. So I read a lot of books, and when you're reading books, you sort of think through the different motives of different characters and what, what motivates people and how they think and how they act. Uh, you analyze texts, you analyze arguments, and most of my assignments were writing persuasive papers. So I learned how to persuade people better than I would have otherwise learned. And persuading people is important in anything you do, building coalitions, organizing your neighborhood, um, law, or just even selling. You know, persuasion is just a key skill to learn. Um, and after Michigan, I mean, I graduated in three years and took a year off in Paris. And I've, I've tended to do a lot of this where I work really hard for a few years and take kind of a mini retirement for a, for a few months or a year. Uh, you know, right now I'm on a month long mini retirement. Just came back from surfing uh, and I'm you know, giving a talk here. Um, so after Paris, I went to Harvard Law School. Now, Harvard was also awesome. Lots of smart, interesting people. Uh, I learned a lot. I, I found my passion for the internet and new technology and new things there. I also found my mentor. This is Yochai Benkler. And I knew he would be my mentor because of his resemblance to Albus Dumbledore. And uh, an Israeli legal theorist. And his argument was that the internet would be shaped as much by law as by technology. That the law of telecommunications, of wireless spectrum, of copyright, of privacy, of uh, freedom of expression, all of these would shape the internet and determine whether or not it was gonna be like cable TV or some sort of centralized medium controlled by a few powerful people where you needed permission to innovate or if it would be a decentralizing tool for the little guy right, that anyone could use. And so why was I taken by this message? Why did this appeal to me? And you, got, you guys probably don't remember life before the internet. This was like 2002. Um, and life before the internet was pretty awful in lots of ways that I don't need to get into. But this was before people had dial-up at the time. It's five years before, more than that, before the iPhone, uh, maybe a decade before the iPhone, uh, before Facebook was invented. And at the time, you know, six or seven companies owned most of the media companies. There were a few record labels who determined, and the radio stations that determined what you could hear. There were, um, there, there were just a few um, you know, newspapers, and if you wanted to communicate with people, you had to you know, write a letter to the editor. In a sense, you get a permission slip from some person to let you communicate in your community. And you know, if, if you took really good photos with a filter or without, there was nowhere to, sh to share them. Right? And the internet came along, and, and I wanted to have an impact in the world, and I thought, this is going to be like the foundation of a new house. Everything is going to be built on this thing. And anyone who wants to organize politically, from you know, everything from gun control to taxes to, to war to healthcare, they're gonna be using the internet to organize and to communicate. And anyone who's gonna build a company to you know, an e-commerce, uh, to sell things, to book cabs, to rent out your house, to, uh, to share vi videos and images to connect people, all of this was gonna happen on the internet. And I, so I thought, this is really a high leverage way to have an impact on the world, making sure that the internet becomes 
uh, decentralized and free for the little guy and not controlled by the few. So before I get to my, my life at Hyperloop One and working within a company, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, my years working on internet freedom issues. Now, when I worked on internet freedom issues, I had lots of different jobs. A lot of them were at new organizations. I was the head lawyer for a new advocacy group. I was on the board of directors of three different newish advocacy groups. I was at a think tank for a pretty new activist group. I was an academic for a new academic center. And I started my own consulting firm, which I had for about five years. And my clients included, you know, my personal clients were like Google, Apple, SoftBank, Dropbox, eBay, Tumblr. So I had really good clients. Um, and it came from, from the first case I, I handled. What, I, what I'm known for in the internet freedom world is three main cases I worked on. Uh, the first was in 2007. I was four years out of law school. And a company called Comcast, which is the largest cable company in the country and the most beloved company in the whole nation, uh, was blocking peer-to-peer -peer protocols like BitTorrent and others, which were legal and extremely popular. So I was four years out of law school. This was the biggest case in the history of the internet that was going to determine its future and whether or not cable companies could block websites and applications. So I was completely unqualified for this, but I wrote a complaint uh, and, and litigated this case. This is actually a picture of me and Yochai Benkler, my mentor, testifying at a hearing before the FCC. And no one thought we could win. I mean, this, all three of these cases I worked on, very high profile. You know, I, was, I was in all the newspapers. I was on all the radio stations. I was on all the TV stations. Once my dad was at a restaurant, just saw me on TV one day. Uh, they were really big cases, and they were all completely impossible. Right? We were told by congressional staff, by journalists, that we could never win. Uh, and we won all three of them, which goes to show that you know, if you follow conventional wisdom, you'll never do anything exceptional, and you'll never be invited to entrepreneurship hour uh, at Michigan. Uh, so, uh, so this case uh, was a lot of hard work, had an amazing team behind us. And in the end, we convinced the Bush era FCC, which up until that moment completely opposed net neutrality, completely opposed the idea that cable companies must be stopped from blocking applications. We convinced them to rule in our favor. When they ruled in our favor, there was a 20-year veteran of the public interest community that called this victory in the Comcast BitTorrent case the biggest victory in 20 years of public interest advocacy. Uh, Larry Lessig, a well-known Stanford professor of, the, of internet law, called it the best decision a government ever wrote about the internet. And there was a profile of me on the front page of Comcast's hometown newspaper, uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and the headline above the banner was Big Victory for Geek Lawyer. And the <laughs> first line of this article, I kid you not, was Marvin Amori is a geek, which was true. Uh, and this is a picture of me the day we, the, day we, uh, the moment I was first reading the decision. Uh, and it, you know, it helped stop cable companies from blocking applications and websites. And the principle of net neutrality, which is just the principle that the internet will remain neutral and cable companies can't block websites or speed some up or slow some down. It's gone through two steps forward, one step back. We won a case, we lost a case, we won a case. So it'll come up again, but this, you know, had we lost this, the internet would have been you know, pretty much screwed forever. Oops. Second uh, big case I worked on a few years later, there was a copyright law that would have really hurt all of the websites that have user-generated content. So think of websites where people upload content to share. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, pretty much most of the websites that we use. Right? It wouldn't have affected websites where you had like a professional distributor, like newspapers, studios, um, film distributors. And it would have really hurt amateur culture. So you know, I remember when I was working on this case, I was being lectured by a congressional intern who was like, Marvin, this new copyright law is going to pass. Don't even, don't even try. And the Chamber of Commerce plus the AFL-CIO were both in favor of this. It was like the only bipartisan legislation that might have passed. 40 of the 100 US senators had co-sponsored the bill and put their name on it. 
I mean, it was completely inevitable. And then uh, with a whole bunch of activist groups and companies, we organized an internet-wide blackout for a day and told everyone to call their congressman. You know, Wikipedia was involved, Google, Reddit, and we melted all the phone lines. No one could get any work done in Congress for a day. And the next day, what had been inevitable was completely impossible. Everyone ran away from the bill, uh, and we won. Uh, and this, uh, for this, I was named one of the one of the hundred most creative people in business by Fast Company. And you know, me and all my friends got a lot of um, profile for the, a lot of recognition for the team we put together to do this. And then 2014 and 15, this is the last net neutrality fight I was involved in. Uh, again, it was completely an impossible fight. I remember telling the Google lobbyist how I planned on getting net neutrality back through the Federal Communications Commission and as the director of policy at Google. And he said, what's your strategy? How are you going to do this? And I started explaining. And he just started laughing, cut me off, and said, it'll never work. Even if we devoted all of our resources to this and all the other big companies did, you'll never, ever win. But then you know, we organized a letter with 150 companies that eventually got the signatures of Microsoft, Facebook, Google, uh, and everyone else. Um, we, um, John Oliver did a segment on it. His, not, his fifth episode actually was on net neutrality. It was his first episode where he did a long segment of like 15 minutes about something. It's where he found his voice. He crashed the FCC website, and this went viral, and we just worked every angle, and we eventually convinced the White House with a tweet by, the, by President Obama, signed B.O., meaning he tweeted himself, and like a video he made, come out with a plan that was essentially the, the exact plan that we wanted that everyone thought we could never get. Um, and so um, after, um, after this fight, there, was, uh, there were a whole bunch of profiles about us. Right? I was named all these fancy things in magazines. And, uh, and I realized that everyone who was getting credit were, were white guys. Right? Like the, the CEO of Tumblr, uh, me, John Oliver, the FCC chairman. So I wrote an article in Slate called The Women Who Won Net Neutrality. And it's listed a whole bunch of different people. Uh, there were women, people of color, you know, people on the fringes and nonprofits. All these people were part of our team. And one of the things that I liked about advocacy was that it was very much a team sport. No one was in it for themselves. That's one of the reasons why I like startups. Right? No one ever gets rich at a startup because they got a promotion, no matter how many other people get fired. Right? You, get, uh, you do well at a startup because the whole company succeeds, dominates the market, and all, and all of your equity goes up. And uh, yeah, as they say in Game of Thrones, the lone wolf dies, but the pack survives. So it's all about teamwork. Uh, there's, there's a picture. So it was fun. It was fun, and it was really meaningful. So then I came to Hyperloop One, and you know I'd done a lot of interesting things. I was good with government affairs. Good, you know, I had a reputation in law. But if you're thinking, you know, if you someday find yourself thrust into an environment where you don't know what you're doing, or if you're thinking of starting a company and you're daunted by it and you want to hear the inspiring tale of somebody else who had no idea what he was doing and figured it out, let me tell you about my time at Hyperloop One. So the first thing I did is I had to learn a lot. There were so many things I didn't know about. I had to like, figure out what marketing did, what finance did. Like I had to understand my own company. And I spent, I had to evaluate my outside counsel. I needed to evaluate my own team. I needed to figure out how to recruit and hire a team. I spent a lot of time reading books. Now, I would, I would spend my time learning however you like to learn. If you like to learn with spreadsheets and cash flow statements, you should do that. I liked books. Read a lot of Harvard Business School books, read books about companies I admired, like you know, Google and Amazon. You know, I remember someone said to me, Marvin, this is how we did it at my old company. It's a $5 billion company. It's how it's done at big companies. And I said, well, Google's $700 billion worth, so they're about 140 times more successful than your company. And they do it the exact opposite way, because often, unconventional ideas are actually the ones that get you the most exceptional results. So I spent a ton of time reading, and I learned really a lot from it. And when you, when you, you know, I think Bill Gates was asked what superpower he wished he had, and he said to read faster. And Drew Houston, whose company Dropbox is going public soon, he said he learned business mainly through reading books while in college. So two, you have to figure out 
One, how to be like efficient with your time, but far more important is how to allocate your time. What, what do you spend your time on? That's, that's actually more important than doing things fast. And so through reading and thinking, it, you know, I just concluded that people were the most important thing I needed to spend my time on, and, and that they were too important for the recruiting team to do. So I did my own recruiting for my, excuse me, for my legal team. I wrote their job descriptions. I read every resume. I wrote up all of the interview questions. And they were designed in a way to, to, to find the exact kind of people I wanted. I value capability over experience. Right, especially at a startup experience, it didn't matter that much to me. And I valued team orientation. And I remember when I left Hypergroup One, one of the guys on my team said, you know, we've been through a lot, all these ups and downs at a startup, and every time it happened, our team just pulled closer together. And I said, well, that was on purpose. Do you remember all the questions I asked you during your interview about how you make decisions, how you deal with hard uh, things, if you've ever played team sports, things like that? That was all, you were all chosen by design to be a team that would come together. And, and have this kind of, this kind of culture. So uh, this team, my, my legal team before I showed up was kind of not, that, not super respected within the company and then became seen as I think probably the, the strongest team within the company. And you know, pound for pound, I think this was one of the best legal teams in the, you know, in, in the country. So um, the other thing that I give a lot of thought to, <clears throat> when, before I went to a company, I'd hear people talk about corporate culture building a corporate culture. And I was convinced this was like MBA mumbo jumbo, uh, that like culture, like just some sort of soft, fuzzy thing. And once I was at Hyperloop One and there were some cultural issues that led to, to this founder dispute, I realized just how important it was and I thought back on all the places I've worked that have had strong cultures, that have you know, principles they live by and reward people based on on being part of the, and having those principles. So even Michigan has a defined culture. Harvard Law School has a defined culture. The organizations I was part of stood for something and hired and fired people based on that. And so, I mean, with my legal team, part of our culture was that I didn't micromanage anyone, right? I took jobs because I wanted to learn and to grow and to have lots of responsibility. And so that's how I treated them. And obviously they made lots of mistakes. People make mistakes, it's how they learn, it's how I learn. And so you just have to delegate, let people run the things, give them guidance. And uh, another executive was, I think, trying to criticize me and said, you don't manage the legal team, you, 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 you lead them. And that was, as far as I was concerned, the exact right way to, 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 to do this, um, if I, if I, to have the kind of people I wanted. So, so being conscious about culture, uh, if you're building a company, I think is really important. Finally, strategy, there are 100, thousand strategy decisions you make having to do with your competitive advantage or market entry, and a startup could go totally awry by making one mistake. And you know, one, of, you know, one core strategy we had was we could have tried to build a Hyperloop system from San Francisco to LA, which is where it was first proposed by the guy who invented the concept, uh, but we just needed to build a Hyperloop somewhere, right, anywhere. So we had a, this thing called the Global Challenge. We asked the world, hey, who wants a Hyperloop? And all these governments from around the world applied, provided data, arguments for why we should pick them. And then we were able to have a funnel of people who were interested in a Hyperloop. We could talk to them and find, you know, where would our first Hyperloop be? And that was, I think, a smart strategic decision. So um, as I said, I'm moving into the cryptocurrency world. I've actually been interested in it for five years. Uh, through my work on internet freedom. And there are two reasons I'm really interested in it. One, the freeing up financial system around uh, privacy, something that I've worked on for a long time. I didn't mention this, but I worked briefly on the, uh, as a, with Apple as a client on the FBI San Bernardino encryption case a few years ago. So I've worked on encryption and privacy. And uh, also, there's, a, there's the use of cryptocurrency and blockchain to decentralize applications in a way that I think will empower more people. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and I noticed that I kept spending my nights and weekends reading about cryptocurrency. And if you're spending your nights and weekends on something, you might as well try to find a way to make that your career. Uh, because if you love what you're doing, you're never working a day in your life. So Michigan, um, you know, as I said, 
All five of my parents' children went to Michigan. My brother married a Michigan alum. My sister married a Michigan alum. This is my, my nephew, dressed like Jim Harbaugh, He's hanging out right there. Um, and, uh, and so for me, you know, Michigan is this awesome extended family, uh, and you guys are my people. So I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I've simply told you my story, what's worked for me. If I do have any advice for you, if you want to take it, it's definitely don't take a job you're qualified for. Have, you know, have fun. Um, and just don't take life too seriously because you'll never get out of it alive. <laughs>